To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. In an experiment in the 1940s, Dr. Mamie Phipps Clark and her husband, Dr. Kenneth Clark, gave black children four dolls to choose from. Two were white with yellow hair and two were brown with black hair. The children were asked which doll they preferred. The Clarks found that the children often preferred to play with the white dolls and were more likely to associate those dolls with positive traits, like being good and nice, while the brown dolls were more likely labeled as bad and mean. The study concluded that black children had internalized the idea that black people were inferior and less attractive than white people because of widespread prejudice against black people in American society. This research was later used in the 1954 Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education. The prosecution used the findings to back up their argument that schools should be integrated. In the end, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in schools was unconstitutional, which kicked off a much longer fight to actually desegregate schools. This was the first time psychological research was used to impact a Supreme Court decision and lead to social change. And it helps show not only the importance of psychological research, but also how much opportunity there is in the field of psychology to help people and to be at the forefront of interrupting the status quo and creating positive social change. Hi, I'm Deja Fitzgerald, and this is Study Hall, Intro to Psychology. We can think of the field of psychology like an umbrella. Historically, the umbrella hasn't been opened very far, so a lot of psychology only accounts for people from weird societies. And one more time, not weird like I'm weird for eating ice cream even though I'm lactose intolerant, but weird is in Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. But many psychologists have been working for decades to expand the psychological umbrella. Like back in the 1950s, a psychiatrist from Martinique named Franz Fanon wrote about colonialism and the psychology of oppression. In Fanon's view, oppression has lasting effects on people and groups. So he called for colonized peoples to claim their independence, in part by rejecting imperial values and centering their own cultural practices and worldviews. This process is called decolonization. Within in the field of psychology, decolonization means rejecting narrow historical ideas and practices and making sure that marginalized groups are also included in the field. Another view on expanding the reach of psychology is known as liberation psychology. This field was developed in Latin America in the 1980s by social psychologist Ignacio Martín Baró, and its goal is to allow individuals, local cultures, and experiences to guide psychological care. Liberation psychology helps psychologists empower people who have historically been excluded or oppressed. Over the years, psychologists have begun the work of decolonizing and making the field more inclusive in a variety of ways like by expanding the definition of who gets to be involved in the field. For instance, when the American Psychological Association, or APA, was created in the 1890s, women mostly weren't allowed to study psychology. Then the feminist movement in the 1960s helped them form the Association for Women Psychologists. And inspired by the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, psychologists also formed new associations representing ethnic minority psychologists and communities, like the Association of Black Psychologists, and the Society of Indian Psychologists. Psychological research practices have also become more inclusive. Community-based participatory research, or CBPR, is a research method that approaches research as a partnership where community members, researchers, and organizations work together. Researchers speak with communities instead of for communities. This gives everyone a chance to share their experiences and expertise, which gives psychologists a better understanding of a certain topic or phenomenon and makes sure that research is led by the people it's supposed to serve. For example, one CBPR project worked with members of the Genegahaga indigenous community in Gunawage, Canada. This community had a high rate of developing type 2 diabetes, which is preventable. So in 1994, community leaders and psychological researchers created the Gunawage School's Diabetes Prevention Project to tackle the problem. They built a plan that promoted exercise and healthy eating. The plan was rooted in psychological theories of behavior and community change, but it also incorporated important Genegahaga values like shared responsibility, a holistic approach to health, and understanding how current decisions affect future generations. Combining community, leadership, and academic perspectives through CBPR helped the Genawage community develop a health intervention plan that was collaborative and enduring. 
Along with diabetes prevention, the program also helped to change the Ganawage's community's beliefs about diabetes and build up the community's ability to collaborate and share information. When psychological research is more inclusive, it can have wide-reaching effects. The ideas of psychology can influence public opinion, reduce societal stigma, impact governmental policies, and change mental health practices, which means there are way more people propping up that umbrella. For instance, the term microaggressions has become more widely used and understood in recent years. Merriam-Webster added the term to the dictionary in 2017, but the term was first coined in the 1970s by the psychiatrist Chester M. Pierce to describe the ways black people experience daily discrimination. Then in 2007, psychologist Daryl Wing Su defined different types of microaggressions people experience, like micro-invalidations that invalidate marginalized people's experiences, or micro-insults, which are rude or insensitive comments about people's identities. This spurred more psychological research into my microaggressions, and then that was taught to students and clinicians. Soon, the term made it into the mainstream as people talked more about microaggressions and as reporters shared new research with the public. This research has also expanded into microinterventions, which give individuals and organizations the tools to address and prevent microaggressive behaviors. Psychological research has been a powerful tool to combat stigma around sexual orientation and gender identity, which has influenced governmental policies and laws. Gregory Herrick, a researcher specializing in public opinion towards LGBTQ people, testified before members of Congress in 1993. He said there was nothing about a person's sexual identity that made them unfit for military service, and that thinking otherwise was prejudice. His testimony, and the research that supported it, helped repeal the U.S. military's Don't Ask, Don't Tell policies, which prohibited gay and lesbian people from serving in the armed forces. And psychological research has changed how we understand mental health. For instance, in the 1950s, psychologist Evelyn Hooker asked both gay and straight men to, among other tests, take Rorschach tests. That's those ink splatters that look like a squished frog or an upside-down bat if you squint hard enough. The results from Hooker's experiment show that gay men were as psychologically normal as straight men. Thanks to Hooker's work and other research it inspired, psychologists stopped labeling homosexuality as a psychological disorder in 1973. But the work of expanding the influence of psychological research isn't finished. These days, the American Psychiatric Association also makes it a priority to share research about contentious rights issues. For example, research shows that abortion does not affect a birthing person's mental health outcomes when compared to other pregnant people, and that sexual orientation has no effect on a couple's ability to raise children. And it's not just psychologists that are pushing the umbrella open. Members of marginalized communities themselves are also speaking up to make others aware of the struggles they have faced and to improve their situation. For example, in 2013, George Zimmerman was on trial for murder. Zimmerman was a 28-year-old man living in Florida who shot and killed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, an innocent black teenager who was walking home from a convenience store. When Zimmerman was found not guilty, the public was outraged. Three black women activists named Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal Tometi seized the opportunity to start a social movement called Black Lives Matter. Their goal was to show love and support for the black community and to create the social infrastructure people needed to be empowered to fight for real changes in their communities. And that change was needed for many reasons, including protecting people's physical and mental health, Racial oppression can make people believe negative stereotypes about their own racial group, which is called internalized racism. And over time, internalized racism can cause psychological distress, including depression and anxiety. So having a strong infrastructure in place could transform members of their communities from bystanders who aren't taking any action into upstanders who would join their movement to expose anti-black racism and police violence against the black community and fight for better treatment. Over the next few years, the Black Lives Matter movement grew in response to several more cases of police brutality against black people. As a grassroots movement, activists in various cities organized their own local events and protests under the Black Lives Matter name. As a result, hundreds of thousands of people attended protests around the United States and the world. Hashtags like Black Lives Matter took over social media and public opinion began to shift. Now, many more people were likely to recognize that racial profiling was a problem in policing. The movement is ongoing, but has led to new policies across the nation, ranging from implicit bias training for police officers all the way to more federal oversight for police departments. These kinds of social movements give marginalized communities a voice and platform to fight against the systems that are harming them. 
They help politicians, business owners, and other members of the general public become more aware of the issues that affect marginalized communities every day. And they show the power of social movements, encouraging more and more people to speak up for themselves or offer support to others. But they also provide more opportunities for psychologists and future psychologists to ask questions and study people, groups, and social movements. And this work, in turn, can help enact policies and programs that will help people and change society. By bringing attention to societal injustices and advocating for change, social movements have pushed psychology to confront its own biases and embrace important changes that improve diversity, representation, and quality of care. Psychology has the potential to be a powerful force of social change. It can provide the research, knowledge, and tools needed to challenge oppressive systems, promote equity, and advocate for the well-being of all individuals individuals and communities. And this is a work in progress. But this work is important, not just for future psychologists, but for everyone looking to cooperate with their fellow humans these days. Because we all have a role to play in pushing the umbrella wide open and making sure it stays there. If you're enjoying Study Hall, Intro to Psychology, and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching.